Abdul Baha's voyage from New York to Liverpool took eight days. The White Star liner, RMS Celtic, reached the port on a cloudy evening on the 13th of December, escorted in her final approach by a crowd of noisy tugboats hooting through the fog. Hippolyte Dreyfus Barney had come from Paris to welcome Abdul Baha back to Europe. He and a group of friends from Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds watched as the great ship emerged slowly out of the dark night. Monsieur Dreyfus went up on deck. The master embraced him as newspaper men began to cluster round. They bombarded Abdul Baha with questions about his trip to America. His replies appeared in the next day's papers. Before he disembarked, the captain expressed his pleasure and his honor at hosting the master on this voyage on behalf of all the crew, the maids, and the other passengers. One of the maids confessed that she had never met any passenger before who had been as kind and as generous to all of them as the master had been. Surrounded by expressions of joy and gratitude, the master left with Dreyfus and Mahmoud Zaghani for the newly inaugurated Adelphi Hotel, where he would stay for three days. Back from the new world to the old one, the master accepted an invitation to speak to the Theosophical Society of the city. Afterwards, he expressed his pleasure at his reception in Liverpool. But all the while, he was keenly following the peace negotiations taking place in London. For the ambassadors of the great powers had gathered at the capital to consult about the Balkans where the storm clouds were gathering and war was imminent. As soon as he returned to London by train, the master began to receive a constant stream of visitors. They came to 97 Cadogan Gardens, the home of Lady Blomfield, where he had stayed on his prior trip to the capital. One of the most prominent was Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst, leader of the suffragette movement, which had been calling women to be given the vote for several decades. Given the reluctance to accept change and the inveterate traditionalism of the British establishment, the tactics to which this movement had been driven were by now quite radical. The suffragettes had taken to blocking public roads, disrupting traffic and handcuffing themselves to the rails of the Parliament buildings in order to draw attention to their cause. Mrs Pankhurst was very pleased with her interview with the Master because although he counselled against violent tactics, he encouraged Emmeline to continue the work of her movement. Women, he assured her, would shortly take their rightful place in the world. Abdu'l-Bahá elaborated on the relationship between men and women by using the metaphor of two wings. If humanity was to soar ever higher, he told her, we need both wings to be equally strong. Then he added whimsically, what if I prove that woman is the stronger wing? You will earn my eternal gratitude, she replied. Earlier in America, in response to a reporter who had asked for his opinion of the suffragist movement, the master had said, In fact, women have a superior disposition to men. They are more receptive, more sensitive, and their intuition more intense. When Emmeline wanted to know if Abdul Baha considered himself a prophet, he responded with modest irony. No, I am a man just like you. Another prominent figure who came several times to see the master in Cadogan Gardens was Edward Granville Brown, the famous Orientalist. He noticed how happy Abdul Baha was and how joyous since the last time they had met 22 years before in Akka. On the 26th of December, 1912, he was asked, what is the purpose of our lives? Abdul Baha responded, to acquire virtues, and then proceeded to explain the evolution of life from the mineral to the vegetable to the animal kingdom and ultimately the world of humanity, which is uniquely gifted with reason, the power of invention and spiritual insight. Abdul Baha also traveled to Oxford to speak at Manchester College. On his way, he stopped at the home of the famed theologian Dr. T.K. Cheney at his invitation. 
Professor Cheney was ill at the time, and Lady Blomfield, who was accompanying the master, described how Abdul Baha took this man and his angelic wife into his loving embrace. The meeting was so moving that the master's eyes were filled with tears. Many others also wept. It was, according to Lady Blomfield, too intimate to describe. Dr. T. K. Cheney would embrace the Baha'i faith that same year. The master arrived in Edinburgh on the 6th of January 1913. His visit in the dead of winter only lasted four days, but each day was packed with activities. He stayed at the home of Mr. and Dr. Alexander White, the moderator of the General Assembly Free Church of Scotland and the principal of the Divinity Faculty of Edinburgh University. Their home at 7 Charlotte Square is now owned and preserved by the National Trust of Scotland for public view. Back in London after a brief passage through Bristol, the master prepared for his return to France, leaving Victoria train station for Paris on the 21st of January. Lady Blomfield was among the large crowd of well-wishers, recounting that we stood bereft of his presence as he spoke courteous words of farewell with that love-laden smile. During the master's nine-week stay in Paris, men and women of all backgrounds were to meet and be inspired by his peerless personality. After travelling to Stuttgart, Budapest and Vienna, he returned to Paris before sailing on the SS Himalaya from Marseille to Port Said. He remained for a prolonged stay in Ramla, Egypt, and then at long last returned to Haifa. His historic journeys were concluded on December the 5th, 1913. He had only been back in Haifa for six months when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, successor to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated. As he had so often warned during his travels, it only took a single spark to set off the powder keg that was Europe. The First World War had begun. It was an uncertain time for the world. It was also an anxious time for the Baha'i community. Haifa was under constant threat of bombardment. The Ottomans were opposed to the Western Allies and Russia and aligned with the Central Powers in Germany. This created great tensions for British interests in the region. With the war in progress and trade impeded, Abdul Baha realized that there would not be enough to feed the population of Palestine. Well before his visit to the West, he had bought various plots of land near the city of Tiberias and in the Jordan Valley and instructed the Baha'is to grow grain and other crops in this fertile region. He taught them to store their harvests in pits used by the Romans centuries before, which not only kept the grain fresh but also protected it from theft. Many souls were able to survive the war through the prescience of the master and this stock of precious grain. Major Wellesley Tudor Pole, who had already met Abdul Baha in Egypt and London, was serving in the Directorate of Military Intelligence in the Middle East during the course of the war. In 1918, he received news that Abdul Baha was in great danger. Jamal Pasha, one of the most powerful men in the Turkish Empire, instigated by Muhammad Ali, Abdul Baha's half-brother, had designs on Abdul Baha's life. This matter also brought to the attention of Lady Blomfield had caused her to approach British authorities directly. Tudor Pole gave a letter to one of his friends who was going to London. He asked him to deliver it promptly to the British cabinet, which at that time included Lord Lamington, who had known and met Abdul Baha in London too, as well as Lord Curzon, an Orientalist, historian, and keen observer of the Babi and Baha'i persecutions in Persia. As a result, a telegram was immediately sent from the cabinet to Lord Balfour, whose task was to liberate Haifa, and also to General Edmund Allenby in the Holy Land, ordering them to extend every protection to Abdul Baha and his friends. While these people were growing increasingly worried about him, Abdul Baha himself was the essence of calm detachment, reassuring those around him and doing everything possible to alleviate their anguish. 
and although his correspondence with them was disrupted by the hostilities, he was also thinking about his dear friends in other parts of the world. He was communicating with them constantly through his prayers, as well as through the uncertain postal service, urging them over and over again to teach the cause, to carry on his work. In the course of those fateful years of World War I, Abdul Baha drafted 14 letters which came to be known as the Tablets of the Divine Plan. These immortal missives were addressed to the Baha'is of the United States and Canada, and in them, Abdul Baha reminded the friends of Christ's exhortation to his disciples to travel to every corner of the world in order to spread his message. Now, the Baha'is of North America were being given the same mission. The Tablets of the Divine Plan were the Master's historic legacy to humanity. They were the pattern for all future plans to be launched by Shoghi Effendi, the beloved guardian of the faith, and thereafter by the supreme elected body, the Universal House of Justice. Following their receipt, many Baha'is packed their bags, left their homes, and went out to establish the faith in the four corners of the world. In vivid contrast to the breaking down of the old order unleashed by the war, Abdul Baha's tablets created a blueprint for the establishment of the new world order of Baha'u'llah. The Battle of Megiddo in September 1918 proved to be the climactic battle of the Sinai and Palestine campaign of the First World War. German and Ottoman forces found themselves encircled by the Allied armies of the British and French under the command of General Allenby. This battle effectively marked the end of World War I in the Middle East, as well as the centuries-old Turkish domination over the Holy Land. The Ottoman Empire would be split apart with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. In recognition of his services to the inhabitants of Palestine during the war, Abdul Baha was made an honorary knight of the British Empire. The British government had not forgotten that during the famine of the war years, the foresight of Abdul Baha had provided enough wheat to feed not only the people of Palestine, but British soldiers as well. An automobile was provided for him to attend the ceremony of the investiture, but he preferred to use a horse-drawn carriage instead, driven by his faithful and beloved servant Isfandiyar. While he accepted the knighthood and participated in the ceremony that was officiated by Field Marshal Allenby acting as the official representative of the British Empire, Abdul Baha never used the title Sir Abdul Baha Abbas, always preferring the simple Abdul Baha, Servant of Baha. In spite of his advanced age, Abdul Baha continued to maintain his grueling schedule. He kept up with his ever increasing correspondence, his visits from officials, his charitable works for the poor. He accepted the request to act as president of a society in Haifa for the purpose of improving conditions in the city and surrounding area. He was a source of comfort to many and an inspiration to all. In addition to his Tablets of the Divine Plan, Abdul Baha's lasting legacy to the world was his covenant, as enshrined in his will and testament. While he had already articulated the significance of the covenant during his travels in America, it was his will and testament, which was a de facto interpretation of Baha'u'llah's Book of the Covenant and his Kitabi Akdas, which confirmed its continuation through the ministries of his grandson Shoghi Effendi and a duly elected Universal House of Justice. These twin inheritors of his will would successively provide the worldwide Baha'i community with guidance, direction, and unity for the rest of the dispensation. One evening in 1921, Abdul Baha turned to his gardener, who had just finished his day's work, and said, I also have finished my work. I can do nothing more. Therefore, I must leave it and take my departure. In the morning of November 27th, Abdul Baha took tea as usual with his family. In the afternoon, there was a celebration at the Shrine of the Bab in honor of the Day of the Covenant. Abdul Baha sent his family to attend it, for he himself could no longer do so. In the evening, he inquired after the health of everyone in the household, the pilgrims and the friends in Haifa. Very good, very good, he said when he heard that no one was ill. At eight o'clock, he went to bed. He told his family, I am quite well, and urged them all to take their rest. Two of his daughters stayed up with him. It was an hour and a half after midnight 
on Monday, 28th of November, 1921, when he passed away. His daughter, Ruha, thought he was asleep, but his spirit had flown to its eternal home. The next day, Palestine witnessed an outpouring of grief that had never been seen before. More than 10,000 souls spontaneously gathered to mourn the loss of the one they venerated and to accompany his casket to its final resting place on Mount Carmel. Each of them had been touched by this unique being. Many owed their very lives to him for the grain he had stored to save them from starvation during the war years. Others owed their well-being to his generosity, care and support over the decades. Still others had depended on the spiritual joy and the deep hope and happiness that he had brought into their lives. The governor of Jerusalem confessed, I have never known a more united expression of regret and respect than was called forth by the utter simplicity of the ceremony. High and low bowed their heads to him, united in sorrow and in common grief. Despite the differences that existed between some, despite the fractious tensions and petty jealousies that divided others, their devotion towards the Master had brought together an assembly of mourners from every faith, race, background and class. The funeral of Abdu'l-Bahá was a veritable feast of love in the honour of the mystery of God. Abdu'l-Bahá's own words of love remained ringing in many ears on that occasion. The most great, peerless gift of God to the world of humanity is happiness born of love. The year 2021 marked the centenary of the passing of the master, Abdu'l-Bahá. In his honour, a special shrine was being built between the cities of Haifa and Acre, where he spent most of his life. The design of this magnificent mausoleum approved by the Universal House of Justice is a reflection of the master's selflessness, his deep humility, and his yearning to serve God's creatures. It embodies his embrace of all of humanity, regardless of creed, race, nationality, or persuasion. Abdu'l-Bahá perfectly exemplifies a life consecrated to others. It was a young and happy life at first, that was turned upside down at the age of six with the imprisonment of his father in the notorious Black Pit of Tehran. It was a life of banishment and confinement and hostility for the next 70 years, a life filled with tension and turmoil, danger and threat, until his very last breath on earth. Despite continuing challenges from all sides, this servant of Baha never lost hope. His life will be cherished for generations to come as a shining portrayal of what it means to be a perfect human. His was a saintly life. May the story of his life inspire and motivate us to spread happiness and joy and to strive to think and act for the welfare of all humanity and our home, the planet Earth.